Hey guys, this is Mitch with Fine Point CGI, and today we're gonna talk about the new navigation server inside of Godot 3.5. Now, this is very similar to the navigation mesh that's in 4.0, but I will also make a follow-up video eventually on the navigation mesh in 4.0. Um, but in this case, we're gonna be looking at 3.5 since that's coming out a little bit sooner. Um, some major changes include the ability to have multiple mesh instances, the ability to have navigation obstacles so you can actually avoid collision with objects, and they also added in the ability to bake multiple navigation meshes at runtime. And that's a huge change because that means that we can, you know, rebake our mesh while we're playing and we can add elements and subtract elements while the game is running, which is something that was previously not able to be done. The other major advantage is that the system is way more efficient than it used to be. So in this tutorial, we're gonna go through the process of creating our nav mesh. We're gonna go through all the options. We're going to create our character and set that all up. And then we're gonna talk about multiple navigation mesh instances and runtime baking. So that's what I have in store for you guys today. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first we're gonna go ahead and right click and add in our child node here. And we're gonna go ahead and add in a navigation mesh here. So we'll go ahead and double click on that. And it has a couple of options over here on the right. So if you look at some of these options, you have your up vector, which is basically where up is in the world. So it's gonna orient your characters to that up vector. You have your cell size, which is used for the cell size uh, to resolve your navigation mesh. And then you have your edge connection. And if you see over here, margin, which is the, the margin or the distance that edges will connect to make a valid navigation mesh. So those are some of the options for this here. Now, for us to be able to actually bake our nav mesh, we actually need a navigation mesh instance, okay? And what we'll do is we'll right click and add in a child node, and we can just basically go down and add one of these in. Now, for navigation to work, you have to have a navigation mesh instance. If you don't have one, your nav mesh won't bake. Now, you can, Unlike previous versions of Godot, you can have multiple navigation mesh instances, which is part of the new navigation server, right? So you can actually have, you know, as many as you want. And with runtime baking, you can basically re-render them at will and uh, have them connect and things like that. And, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Now, underneath your navigation mesh instance, you'll see that there is a exclamation point right here. So if we hover over it, you'll see that it says, hey, a navigation mesh resource must be set or created for this node to work. So what that means is if you click on your navigation mesh and you come over here, you can see that there is no nav mesh. Now you can sit here and click on new navigation mesh and that will work. So if you click on that and you do this, you can see all sorts of information here. So if you kind of open all of these up, we'll kind of run through them one by one and we will have a good conversation hopefully about all of them now before we go into all of this let's add some geometry for us to bake our, our mesh because that's going to make things a little easier to explain so what we're going to do is we'll right click add in a child node add in a mesh node and we'll go ahead and add in a mesh instance here and we'll go ahead and make it a plain mesh then I'm gonna go ahead and scale this up to be nice and large. And we'll right click, add in another child node, add in another mesh instance. We will go ahead and make it a cube just like that. And I'm gonna make the cube just a touch smaller, maybe something like that. And we'll make it up here like this, perfect. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click, add in a child node, and add in a collision, not a polygon, add in a collision shape, and we'll go ahead and click on this and click box shape. And I'm doing this on purpose to show you guys the different navigation uh, mesh baking methods here. So you'll see that the collision shape is upset saying, hey, it needs to derive from a static body. So we'll go ahead and do that, add in a child node. 
static body and we'll put this underneath there just to make it so it's not unhappy with us. Now, if we click on our navigation mesh instance and we click bake with default settings, you will see that we have our navigation mesh baked, which is great. You'll notice that it affects our mesh here, but it doesn't affect our collision over here. So it goes off of mesh, not off of collision. Now we do have some partition types and I'll get to that in a minute. That one's a very detailed conversation that we're gonna have to have. But if we come down here to parse geometry type, you can see we have mesh instance, we have static colliders and we have both. Parse geometry type is what the navigation mesh considers a part of the nav mesh. So if you do static colliders and you bake your nav mesh, you'll see that nothing happened. And the reason why is because we don't have a collision mesh on here. So the system doesn't recognize that this, this plane exists. If we right click on it and add in a static body, add in a collision shape and make that into a box shape. So it now wraps around our entire level. And then if we drag this down something like this, when we go to our navigation mesh instance and we click bake, you'll notice that now we have collision and you'll notice that this object is respected. But what if we want both? Well, we have the option for both right here. We can click on our static colliders and it looks like I ran into a bug. So let me try to fix it. There we go. We'll click on both. And that should solve our problem. If I go ahead and I remove this static body here, and then I click on my navigation mesh instance and I click bake, you'll notice that it respects both of them. So that's what that option does. So in my case, I'm going to keep it as mesh instances for now, and we can see what we would like to make it in a moment. Source geometry mode means that basically we can say, do we want our nav mesh children? Do we want a group with their children or do we want specifically a group? So what we can do is we could say group with children and then the source group name. So let's say we want to only affect specific objects. So if we take, for instance, our plane and we attach it to a group and we call it nav mesh, let's say, and we add that to it, you'll notice that when I go to the, my navigation mesh and I make sure that it is the same, you'll see that if I hit bake, it does not care about these two objects. They are no longer in the group for it to work. Now, if I add a child to this, let's take our cube here and put it as a child, and then I bake my navigation mesh, you'll notice that it respects it, right? But if I change this from group with children to group explicit and I click bake, you'll notice that it doesn't respect the cube anymore. And that's because the cube's not part of the group. So that's basically what your options are here. You have nav mesh children, which is all of the children of the nav mesh, which is this instance here. Group with children, which is the group and what's under it. And then group explicit, which is just the people inside of that group which is a really cool option and it's actually kind of nice. Cell is the definition of your mesh itself. So if I come to size here, this specific one deals with the actual size that it, like the subdivision level almost of this mesh. So if I bake my nav mesh here and I come up here and you guys can see the nav mesh, see? If I bring my size up, and I bake my nav mesh, you'll see that it simplifies it down into a cube. Whereas if I bring this down to something like 0.1 and I bake it, you'll see that it bakes it more of like a cylindrical shape. This is very useful if you're doing a complicated shape that needs to be adjusted to uh, perfectly match what you're trying to do. Now, the other big thing here is the height. And height is the height of this nav mesh. So if you bring this down and you bake, you'll see that it goes down in down closer to the actual floor. Now, unfortunately, you can't do something like uh, 0 0.001. So you can't be like 0 0.001 or anything like that. Unfortunately, you're kind of stuck with uh, being where it is. So if I bake like at two, you can see it's way up here, you know? 
So that's just something to keep in mind. You may need to adjust your character or your object so that they're closer to the ground so that they kind of match up. Agent is very useful. So all of these have to do with your agents, not specifically with your player, but with anybody that's on the actual mesh, okay? So agent height is how tall the agent is. So if you make the height five and you bake, it means that the character can be five meters tall. So that's useful if you have something like an overhang or something like that. If, if something is above, so if I grab, for instance, this object and I duplicate it and I bring it up to about here-ish, and granted, we'll see if this works, uh, but you can see when I bake it, how it does not allow people to walk underneath it. But if I bring my nav mess agent down to two, you can see they can walk underneath it. So that's something to keep in mind. The other major one is radius and radius basically sets up the radius between objects that it can walk between. So if you were to set your radius down to 0.1 and you bake your nav mesh, you'll see how much closer and you can walk in between these two objects. But if I bring my radius all the way up and I bake, well, in this case, it's not going to allow you to do anything because uh, the radius is so big, but you can see how it only allows you to walk in this little area because the edge of this mesh versus the edge of these meshes, and then it goes by that radius. So two meters, 2.6, actually, you can even see this is almost a perfect uh, radius setting. So 2.6, that's about 2.6, give or take. Max climb is how high the character can climb. So if you were to bring this down to 0.1, they can't climb on anything. If you bring this all the way up to four, well, if you bring it all the way up to four and you hit bake, you'll see they can now climb on top of the cube. Simple enough. And max slope is the maximum slope that we allow for. So if I take this mesh and I duplicate it and I drag this over and I change it over to a... Actually, I think we could just keep it with a cube. So if I scale this down and then I rotate this at about a 30 degree angle, let's say, and then we make this a local transform here and we scale this up something like that. If I take this object and I put it like this, when I click on my navigation mesh and I bake it, you'll see that they can walk up my navigation mesh. But if I change my max slope down below the 30 degrees and I bake it, you'll see that they can't walk up it. So that's something to keep in mind. For region, region is how big a specific size can be. So how big a region can possibly be. So if you bring this down and you bake it, then that means that the region size, and you can see how they can now climb up this with the 45 change. Um, it means how big a little region could be. So if I set this all the way up to something like 150, you'll notice that nothing bakes. If I bring it down to something like 40, you'll see that nothing bakes. That's because it's 40 meters. That means that this thing needs to be bigger than 40 meters before it will bake or 40 units. If I bring this down to five, you'll see that it once again bakes because it's within the five units of size here. So you can see that's kind of useful if you were to um, say, hey, if a surface is not bigger than X size, let's go ahead and make sure that they don't bake that uh, data. Merge size is how far this is going to reach to merge. So if we bring that all the way up, you'll notice nothing really changes. And if we bring it all the way down, you'll notice not much changes. But if we take a mesh instance here and we duplicate it and we drag it over here like this and let's scale it down to something, I don't know about that big and maybe this big. If we pull this over and then we click bake on our nav mesh, you can see that they can walk over this little parameter here. But if we up our merge size, you'll see that it doesn't make a difference, right? So that's kind of weird, right? Well, what this does is it says anything that's smaller than this value will get merged into this region. So if you were to make it, let's say, a bit smaller and you were to bake and let me see, I might not be able to get this one to work correctly because it, it could be a little on the finicky side. I might need to make this smaller. And let me see. 
bake and then merge size, bring it up, bake. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get this one to work, but basically how it works is, is it takes the sizes and it will merge your uh, regions together to make a more efficient um, nav mesh. Underneath edge, we have max length and max error. Now I've never been able to get max length to really work, but basically what it does is it keeps track of the maximum length an edge can have before it gets ignored by the system. So basically it's the maximum length a contour edge can have before the system goes, ah, I don't really wanna deal with this anymore. Max error is the maximum error that it can simplify this little mesh. So if we were to drag it all the way up to three, you'll see that not much has changed. But if we drag it down to one, like 0.1, you'll see that it kind of makes these weird little blocks here. So it tries to make the edge more um, appropriate to what the object is, if that makes sense. Polygon, verts for poly, this is how detailed your actual mesh is gonna be. So you can kind of bring that down to three. And if you bake, you'll see that um, that the mesh looks like, I guess like this, if that makes sense. And then if you just kind of bring this up to something like 79, you'll see that not much has changed, but the actual number of vertices per polygon has changed. So it's useful for performance and it's useful for um, if there's a crevice or an area that you're trying to get into that you can't, sometimes that can be useful. Um, in general, I keep on the defaults because there's no reason not to. Hey guys, Editor Mitch here. Um, something that I forgot to cover was the different partition types here. So you have three of them that are available. So Watershed is generally the best choice for um, your pre-computed nav mesh. Usually you want to use this in like a large open area when you're dealing with a lot of objects and things like that. It's kind of like the good um, overall style. Then you have your monotone partition right here. And you want to use this if you need fast navigation mesh generation. So if you're running this at runtime and you need to regenerate that mesh right now, this is an awesome way to do it. And then the last one is the layers. And the layers partitioning is good for tiled navigation mesh, you know, with usually medium or small style tiles. So if you have multiple objects that are kind of spaced, or you have multiple uh, navigation mesh instances under it, layers could be faster. Not always, but it can be faster. So that's generally the difference between the, th the three of these. This one is just your good balanced one. This one is extremely fast. And this one is good with lots of medium and small size tiles. So let's go ahead and get back to the video. Now, these last two, detail and filter, uh, these ones I was unable to get to work properly. And it's probably just something that I'm doing. But from what I understand, detail has two options, which is the sample distance and sample max error. Sample distance is the sample distance that the detail map is going to take uh, to determine if something is a valid object. So the smaller the number, the more detailed your detail map is going to be. Uh, be careful because you can see my scene has changed. And the reason why is because I put this to a low value and it completely crashed Godot. So just be careful when you change this, but it can be useful for when Godot is not quite seeing a object that maybe is too small or isn't um, able to be picked up by the detailed map in some way. And sample max error is basically just how much of an error amount is that edge or that uh, object going to have within your detail map to get excluded out of the map. So lower means that it will um, ignore it more often and higher means that it's going to try to not ignore it as much. So under filter, we have low hanging obstacles. This is used when you're creating an obstacle that may be slightly higher or lower uh, than the agent's maximum. So the nice thing about this is if you have an obstacle object, so if you have an object with the obstacle node underneath it, the uh, system will detect it even if it's not directly within the agent's height, if that makes sense. Ledge spans. Ledge spans, basically, if it's set to true, will set ledges to be not walkable. And filter walkable low height 
is basically it'll filter an object that's slightly higher than the agent's height, even if it may be walkable. So it's just something to kind of exclude additional stuff that you might not want the user to be able to walk on. Now, again, I was unable to get these to work properly and it very likely is my own fault. So don't hold that against the actual um, project, but you know, just to let you guys know. All right, so now that we've got all of this kind of ran through, let's go ahead and get a player to walk on our navigation mesh. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new scene and I'm gonna make sure that I save this scene because Godot, like I said, crashed on me and that's gonna break everything and make me lose a lot of work. But we'll go over to our empty scene. We'll click new 3D scene. We're gonna right click on our spatial node, add an a child node and make it a navigation agent here, okay? And a navigation agent is basically what your player is. And you have all these cool options here. So to explain what they are is basically target desired distance is the distance at which your character will actually walk up to a target. So in this case, it's one uh, unit, which I don't quite know how they calculate their units, but basically that's pretty much on top of it. But if you were to increase this up to something like, you know, 75, right, they could stop here and the unit that they could be trying to get to is here, you know, so it, it allows you a lot of great flexibility saying, I just want you to get into that general area. I don't necessarily want you to be directly on top of it. Radius is how wide a navigation agent is. If it has a high radius, if there are two objects that are in between each other, then it won't go between them. So for instance, you see how there's this little section here. If this is smaller than its radius, then the object cannot go through it. So the navigation mess agent will not go through this. Height agent offset. This will actually offset you from your height. So one of the big problems that a lot of people had with the previous version of the navigation agent was how this doesn't quite match up with the floor. See how there's a distance right there. But what you can do is you can actually just come in here and change your agent height offset to minus whatever it is and your agent will actually stick to the floor, which is very useful. Neighbor distance is how far ahead this system's gonna look to see if a neighbor is next to you. So if there's another navigation mess agent, uh, this is how it can determine if there's one near you. Now, usually it, um, you know, it, it does pretty good by default with 50, but you can really drag this up and have it look really far ahead. The problem with doing that is that you are going to make your calculations a lot slower because it has to calculate further ahead. Max neighbors is how many neighbors it can track at one time. Again, it's the same thing. Uh, it's just the number of neighbors that you can track. And um, one of the things that's important to know is that this will greatly affect how fast your system runs. Because if you have your neighbor distance really high and you have your max neighbors really high, you're calculating that distance a bunch of times. And that's going to really slow down your simulation. Time horizon is the amount of time basically that the system's going to calculate its collision avoidance system. So a higher value means it's going to uh, react ahead of time more and a smaller distance means it's going to react ahead of time slower. And if this value is high, then your um, mesh agent is not going to have as much control over its velocity as it would if it was a smaller number. Maximum speed is how fast your uh, mesh agent can run along the mesh. So that's something to keep in mind. And that's a really useful thing. So you can just kind of set it to whatever and it'll say that that's the max, max velocity that your character can move. So this is a really important one. Max path distance is how much your path can deviate from your original path. So for instance, if you were trying to avoid an obstacle, you can go up to three units. So you could go up to three units away to avoid something. Okay. Now this is really useful because, uh, sometimes if you have a lot of obstacles in the way, or you have like an entire room away from the object, 
the system needs to go, oh, I need to avoid this thing, but it's passed my max path distance, so I can't avoid this. So I'm going to run up to the obstacle and then stop until my next calculation to try to figure out a way around it. So that's something to keep in mind. And ignore why. Now, ignore why is an important property. This is basically if it ignores the y axis when it's calculating its path distance. So if you're running up elevation or something like that, this is important to have. And this must be true if you're moving on a horizontal plane. So if you're moving Z or X, then you need to have this set to true. So those are all the options. I'm going to leave them as default because the default options are actually really good in Godot. So we'll just leave it like this for now. And we'll mess with the agent height offset later if we need to. But right now we'll just leave this as what it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click my spatial node. I am going to change my type to a rigid body. And I'm going to go ahead and come into my rigid body. I'm going to go to mode. I'm going to make it a character. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my physics material and add in a physics material. And I'm going to override its friction to zero. And that's about it. Now, the reason why is because I don't necessarily want my player to deal with friction. So I'm just going to say, don't have, don't deal with friction. It's just not needed. So now what we need to do is we need to create some kind of um, collision for this. So we'll go ahead and add in a collision shape here. And we're going to make that a capsule shape. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to right click, add in a child node and add in a mesh instance here. And that's going to allow me to have a capsule mesh. There we go. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my collision shape and my mesh instance. I am going to rotate them like this, and I am going to pull it up until it's above the ground. So we'll just kind of yank this up. That's too far. So we'll pull this down a tiny bit, something like that. That way we have just a basic player. Now, one thing that you will need to do is you will need to make sure that you have a ray cast so you can determine where the floor is. So we're going to right click our spatial node, add in a child node, and add in a ray cast. And this ray cast here is going to ray cast down. Now, I don't remember. I believe it is ray casting down, so that will be perfect. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep it disabled. We're going to exclude our parent because we don't need our parent here. And we're going to cast to, you know, about minus two or maybe minus three. We'll see. We'll play it by ear and see whereabouts it's going to need to raycast. And I'm going to pull this up. So it's just a little bit above the player or a little bit in the player. So that way the player doesn't um, potentially miss its raycast. Now, what else I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and attach a script. And we're just going to call this our player script. I don't need to have script in the name, but that's fine. Um, as I was talking, I just started typing. So what we need to do first is we need to go ahead and get our uh, navigation agent. So we will go ahead and say var nav agent. And then we'll come down here and we'll say nav agent is equal to dollar sign navigation agent. Now we need to go ahead and tell, and I'll make this a little bit bigger because it's hard when Godot uh, screen size is so big. I have to make these things larger. So next, what we need to do is we need to get our target node. So basically what we're going to be targeting as our node, right? simple enough. So what we can do is we can just say export as a node path var our target node. And then we'll go ahead and get our node. So we'll say get underscore node and we'll pass in our target node path. So we'll say just target node. And then we're going to go ahead and tell our navigation agent that actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to say var target node object is equal to get node because I don't want to continuously go get node. And what I'll do is I'll say nav agent dot 
set underscore target location, and I got to pass in a vector three. Now this could be any vector three, but in my case, I'm going to say target node object dot. And you'll see if I type something like global transform, you'll see that I don't have any um, syntax highlighting here. So let's go ahead and cast this object here, target node object as a spatial node. So that way it just is a spatial node. And then I can just come in here and say dot global transform dot origin. And that'll just allow me to have that syntax highlighting that I would like to see. So now what we can do is we can come into our process here and it needs to be physics process. You can use regular process, but I've noticed that there can be some hitching and some issues with it. So I'm just going to go under physics process. So we'll say funk physics process delta, and then we'll go ahead and say var current position is equal to global transform dot origin. And then we're going to go ahead and get our target. Okay. So we'll say var target is equal to our nav agent dot get underscore next underscore location. And you'll see I'm not getting syntax highlighting. So I wonder if I could just do, I believe it's a navigation agent. So we'll just do that. That way I can get some syntax highlighting here. And then we'll come in here and we'll say var velocity is equal to a vector three. There we go. So now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and set our velocity. So we'll say velocity is equal to target minus my current position. And we're going to need to go ahead and multiply it by some kind of speed value. So we'll just say something like 10, simply enough, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to set our velocity. We'll say navigation agent dot set velocity, and we'll go ahead and set it to our velocity. There we go. So now if we go ahead and save, make sure you save, I'm going to change my spatial node to player and I'm going to save. I'll come over here and I will drag my player scene into my spatial node here. And I need to assign it to a target node you can see here. So I will drag this guy over here and I'm going to right click, add in a child node and I'm going to add in a position 3D. I will put that over here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my player. I'm going to select my target node and I'm going to select my position 3D. We'll go ahead and click okay. And let's see if this works. So we'll go ahead and select our current and I don't have any cameras, which would help. So let's go ahead and right click, add in a child node, add in a camera, and let's go ahead and drag our camera out, bring it up. Let's take a look. Nope. That's not where I want it. So we will rotate it, put it right about here, make it a local transform and then angle it down a tiny bit. So we'll just dra drag that down and that will work. So let's go ahead and hit play and let's see what it does. So you'll see the player falls through the floor almost immediately. So that's always a good sign. So we can solve this by going to our mesh instance for our floor, right clicking on it, adding in a child node, add in a static body, and then going ahead and right clicking that, add in a child node, and let's add in a collision shape. And we're gonna have to size our collision shape to actually match. So we'll put a new box shape and you'll see it tried its best to make it the correct size, but it's not quite perfect. and what we need to do is we just need to go ahead and make this a little bit smaller like that. And then if we hit play, you'll see that our player no longer falls through the world. Perfect. That's what we want. Now you'll see the player is not moving at all. And the reason why is because when your navigation agent does its calculations, it sends out a signal and says, hey, your velocity is ready to be used, if that makes sense. So we have to click on our navigation agent, go to our node and say on velocity computed, double click on it, and then you can connect that to your player. 
And once that is there, you can go ahead and set your linear velocity to that calculated velocity. So we'll say set underscore linear underscore velocity. And we'll set that to our safe velocity. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow us to move our player. So if we hit play, you'll see that our object moves. It's not quite perfect, but it did move. Which is pretty cool. So we need to fix this by doing some fancy math here. And what we can do is we can go ahead and get our raycast normal and then we could take that absolute value from that normal and then um basically minus it from a floor value and then calculate our target based off of a normalized value and the reason why is because all of this is kind of um confusing the navigation system so we need to do some additional math to kind of help the system out so what we can do is we can come up here and we can go ahead and say okay var normal is equal to our dollar sign raycast dot get collision normal and then we can say var abs normal is equal to our vector three and then we can take abs normal dot x comma abs normal dot y comma abs normal dot z and what that's going to do is that's going to go ahead and pull back our abs or absolute value so it's going to not care if it's a minus one or not it's just going to pull it back as a positive value so that way um, the navigation mesh doesn't get confused and then we can say var inverse floor normal and is equal to a vector three comma one comma one minus abs normal and what that's going to do is that's going to give our inverse floor normal so that way we can determine exactly where our floor is and what the normal relation of our floor is and then we can say our velocity here is target minus current position multiplied by our inverse floor normal. So INV floor normal. And then we're going to want to normalize that. And what normalization does, I don't know if you guys, if I've covered this in the past, but normalization, what that does is that takes this and scales it to a zero to one value. So that way we can um, more easily have a number to multiply by our 10. So that way we don't get something like 255, right? And then suddenly you're multiplying it by 10 and then your, your calculations are all off here. It just kind of makes it easier. So now what we can do is we can hit play and you'll see our player runs up there and now they're freaking out. So why would they be freaking out? Well, the reason why is because it's not quite getting to the object. And the reason for that is because I made a mistake on our initial build. We need to take our collision shape and pull it down so that it matches with our floor. And then we need to take our player and our spatial node and bring that up until it is a, above the floor. So then when the player falls down, he can now run up to the object that we're trying to get to. So basically the reason why was because we were slightly off in our Y value. So the system was trying to get to it, even though it was below it. Now that we have that, what would happen if we wanted to go ahead and uh, recalculate our nav mesh at runtime, which is probably what most of you guys are here for, right? Well, what we can do is we can go ahead and grab our position and let's just kind of move it over here. And then like, I don't know, move it up here, right? And then let's say come into our navigation mesh agent here and right click add in a child node and let's go ahead and add in a mesh instance here and we'll come up here we'll click on mesh and we'll change it to a cube mesh and we're going to go ahead and bring back that ramp that we had so we'll build a nice little ramp here so we'll just kind of do something like this and then we will scale it up something like that 
And let's just kind of make it do that. And then let's go ahead and grab our plane here. So we'll just kind of grab a plane and we'll just duplicate it and pull it over here and drag it up something like, I don't know, something like that, I guess we'll do. And we'll pull this up so it sort of matches up. And we want to make sure that it has collision. And we also want to make sure this object has collision or else our player will fall through the world. And of course, we don't want that. So we will go ahead and add in some collision here to this object right here. So we'll just right click it, add in a child node, add in a static body here. So we'll kind of come up here, static body. We'll right click, add in a child node and add in a collision shape. And we'll go ahead and just make that shape into a new box shape, which should give it some collision. Now, what we can do is we can go ahead and hide both of our ramp here. So we'll go ahead and hide that. And if we hit bake nav mesh, so if we click on our nav mesh, we click bake you'll see that it actually calculates our nav mesh here. So I'm assuming that it takes that into effect. So if I hide both of those and I bake it, what does that do? It still bakes it, okay. So what we're gonna need to do is we need to go ahead and take this object and create it as a scene and then instance that in, so that way it doesn't get calculated into our nav mesh. So what I'll do, is I will go ahead and right click on this object. Actually, first let's rename it say ramp and let's go ahead and right click it and go ahead and save branch as scene, save it as ramp. And then let's go ahead and right click this, add in a child node, add in a node object here. So we'll just go ahead and add in a spatial node here. And that way I just have a good reference to where the object is. And then we'll go ahead and delete our ramp get rid of it, and then go ahead and bake our nav mesh. And you'll see that it's gone. So if we hit play, what you'll see is our player will run around and he'll stop right here because he can't get above our ramp because we don't have a ramp here. So the system can't get our player to go right up against our ramp because it doesn't exist yet, right? So it goes close as it possibly can until it can't get any closer. And what we'll do is we'll move our camera. So I'll kind of place it right there. I think that will work. And you'll see that it gets as close as it possibly can to our position 3D. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, let's right click on our navigation mesh, attach a script and just call it navigation mesh. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and say, okay, on startup, yield, get tree, dot create a timer and we're going to set that timer to something like five seconds and then we'll say on that timer we'll go ahead and pass a time out and then what we'll do is we'll say var ramp is equal to load res colon slash slash ramp dot tscn and then we'll go ahead and instance that and then we'll go ahead and say dollar sign and find our our spatial node that we had so spatial we probably should have named it but that's okay add child and then we'll pass our ramp object to it and what that's going to do is that's going to throw our child object out into existence and then we can bake our navigational mesh data by doing bake navigation mesh and one of the things that we can do if we want to is we could come in here and we can look at our little signals here and there's actually a bake fa finished and navigation mesh changed that's actually super useful if you wanted to change up how things work or if you wanted to say, oh, well, we changed the navigation mesh. Let's go ahead and, and recalculate everybody's you know positions or something, right? So this is really flexible and super easy to use. So now we're going to go ahead and hit play and let's see what happens. So the reason why this isn't working is because we need to go out to our ramp 
and we need to actually turn on our ramp first of all. And you'll notice that our ramp is not directly on zero, zero, zero. And the reason why this is a problem, and if we set this to zero, 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 I'll keep my scale at what it is, and I'll go to my spatial node, and I'll make sure that my scale is one, one, one. And what that's going to do is that's just going to make sure everything's correct. And the reason why this is going to break it is because we're instancing our ramp here and then offsetting it by the number that we actually moved it. So it ended up somewhere in this general area. So if we actually hit play, you'll see that after a few seconds, after I think it's five seconds, it's going to go ahead and instance that ramp and it's going to recalculate and then it will move to that location. Perfect. Simple enough. So now what if we want to deal with obstacles? Obstacles is something that's new and it's something that's exciting to have here in Godot. Now what a navigation obstacle is, it's an obstacle that this system is going to need to dodge when it's running through its system. So what we can do is we can grab our position 3D. Let's drag it back a bit further so that way the player has to go a bit further. And then let's go ahead and put an obstacle in. Now, an obstacle does not need to be underneath the navigation uh, mesh instance. It actually just needs to be in the navigation tree of some kind. So we can just right click, add in a child node. Let's add in a kinematic body. And then let's right click that kinematic body, add in a child node, add in a collision shape. And then let's right click on that. And actually we will need to add in a, yep. add in a child node, add in a mesh, mesh instance. And then let's go ahead and just add in a small cube here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and add an animation player. And we'll go ahead and animate it once we get it into the right location. And what we need to do to make this a proper collision object is to add in a shape and we'll do that. And then in order for us to make this into a collision object that the navigation system is going to recognize is we need to add in a navigation obstacle node to this. So we'll right click our kinematic body, add in a child node, and then go ahead and add in a navigation obstacle right here. So we'll go ahead and add this in. And now Godot is going to treat this kinematic body as a navigation obstacle. So what we can do is we can kind of bring it over here and just kind of lay it in right about, I don't know, here ish. And we'll actually pull this back a little bit, click on our animation player, add in a new animation, and we can just call it slide side to side and we'll go ahead and click on our kinematic body add in our track call it a property track and click on our kinematic body and click ok and then we can come in here and add any kind of property that we want in our case we're going to go ahead and add in our translation so go ahead and hit that open on that and if we click on this and right click and insert a key and then we say over the course of three seconds I want you to go ahead and move. So we'll insert another key, click on that, and then change this value to whatever we'd like it to be. In my case, I'm gonna want it to be over here. And if we click on our kinematic body, click on our transform and add in a key, that should about do it. So you'll see it goes like this, and that might be too slow. So we'll go ahead and do one second maybe. That's a bit better, a bit quicker. So we'll do that and we will grab this key. We will hit control D and that will duplicate it over here. So now it goes here and then it comes back. Simple enough. So now we can just set this to something like two with repeating and then he will forever go back and forth. Simple enough. Now, something that I've noticed is that we got this weird cube here and I wonder Oh, I have a whole duplicate kinematic body in here. That's strange. So I'm going to delete my duplicate kinematic body. I don't know how that happened. And I'm just going to go ahead and let that run through, which should work. And we'll be sure to check autoplay on load. And now if we hit play and you'll see that the player will wait and then he'll 
run up the thing, get hit a little bit, and then make it across finally. Now, something that I've noticed is that the collision avoidance is not very good, but it's okay at best. So if I were to set this something like five maybe, and then drag this out to something like five and 2.5, we might have a better chance of having this work properly. But I have noticed even in the demos that they've given us that it's definitely not perfect. And in this case, it probably doesn't help very much, but that's generally how the navigation obstacle system works. And it does have an estimate radius, which is basically just saying, hey, how do I determine how big this object is on the navigation mesh? Hey guys, Editor Mitch here. One of the things that you can do to help avoid that block is by coming over here to your time horizon and setting it up to a high number. I had it set to two, but if you actually come up here and set it to something like 31 and then you run it, you'll notice that the player is going to run up here and then he'll stop and then he'll kind of slow down and then slow down again as he runs through. And yes, I know that there's some frame rate issues. It turns out that something's breaking with Godot here. And that's just something that um, I'm sure they'll iron out when they move to beta 2. But anyway, that's all I have for you guys. So let's get back to the video. Now, what if we have multiple navigation mesh instances? Does that actually affect anything, right? Which is a question that I've gotten a few times. If you right click on your navigation mesh and you go ahead and add in a second navigation mesh instance, is that gonna break anything? And the answer to your question is no. So if you add in a second navigation mesh instance and you add in a child node, and you go ahead and add in some mesh here. And then you click on your mesh and set a new plane mesh and you make it nice and large so that way we can fit stuff on it. When we click bake on our navigation mesh instance, you can actually bake. And if you add a new navigation mesh and then click bake, you'll notice that you have a second navigation mesh here. So what happens if we take our position and we place it over here, right? So we just kind of drag this over here and place it right here. How is Godot going to handle this? Well, if we move our camera over here, like so, and we hit play, what is going to happen? Well, the object is going to detect that it's in a different spot and it's going to try to move the player into that spot. Now you'll notice that it's freaking out. And the reason why it's freaking out is because this mesh doesn't have collision. So if I add in a static body and then I add in a collider here and I go ahead and I make that a box shape. And we make that a small box shape, something like that. And then we hit play. It should solve that small problem. There we go. So you can see that you can actually have multiple mesh objects in an area and it's not going to hurt anything. And the nice thing about this is if, for instance, you were to move your navigation mesh instance, you could rebake your navigation mesh once it's done moving and then everything else would calculate correctly. And the last thing that we're going to look at before we take off is being able to uh, animate a navigation mesh instance here. So what would happen if this navigation mesh instance was moved, right? Well, what we can do is we can simulate that by right clicking, adding in a child node and adding in an animation player here. And if we go ahead and add in a new animation and call it something like slide, let's say, we can go ahead and add in a property track and add in a navigation mesh instance too. And then we can go ahead and add in a translation. And what we'll do is we will go ahead and start with our navigation mesh instance out here like this. And then we will go ahead and put in a keyframe. And then we're going to go ahead and say after five seconds, not 50 seconds, five seconds, let's go ahead and move forward until we can touch our 
two objects here. And we'll go ahead and add in a keyframe here. So what's gonna happen is it's going to go ahead and hit play. It's going to slowly but surely get there. And then once it gets there, the player will be able to cross this threshold. Okay. Now, one of the cool things about this is that once you've baked your nav mesh, even if it moves away, you don't need to rebake your nav mesh. The system will understand that they um, can cross over that threshold. So if we hit play and we play this and we kind of let the player go up to the edge of the screen here, he'll wait. And then as the animation player, which it's not, which means I forgot to turn this on automatically. That's my fault. If I let this run, you'll see this gets closer and closer and closer. And then the nav mesh understands that I can go in there and it allows the player to run to its position. So that's pretty much the entire navigation system in a nutshell. Is it uh, perfect? No, but it has a lot of potential and it's a big departure from where we were where we had to have one static scene and that's all we could do so it is an awesome new system and it's a welcome change to the godot community so what do you guys think about the navigation mesh system let me know because i'd like to know what you guys think do you guys think it's actually worth having a new navigation system or should we all just do a star navigation and call it a day but that is all I have for you guys today. So if you like this video, hit that like button. Hey, if you dislike this video, go ahead and hit that dislike button because I am here to make content for you guys. Now, this video was a viewer suggested video as with all of my videos. So if you guys have any suggestions, please throw them in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to create videos that you guys want. That's what this channel is all about. And if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to tell me about the navigation mesh system and anything good or bad about it, or anything that I've done incorrect here, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with you. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much again for watching, and I will see you all next time. Thanks.